For many years, we have been welcoming visitors to the New York Academy of Medicine's Romanesque-style palazzo on the southeast corner of Fifth Avenue and 103rd Street in October to learn about the history of the building as part of Open House New York. Constructed in 1925 and 1926, NIAM sits just across the street from the Museum of the City of New York and the Conservatory Gardens of Central Park. In this tour, I'll mostly be taking you through our Fifth Avenue building, but let's start with a very quick look at NIAM's earlier homes. The founders of the Academy held their first few meetings at the end of 1846 and very early in 1847 at the Lyceum of Natural History, at 563 Broadway. But by March 3rd, 1847, they were renting space in Convention Hall at 175 Worcester Street, and they stayed there until July of 1850. Then the meeting shifted to the small chapel of what is now New York University in Washington Square. Rent in Washington Square rose steadily, and in May of 1868, the Academy moved a little further uptown, renting the lower lecture room of the College of Physicians and Surgeons at 23rd Street and 4th Avenue. But the fellows really wanted a building NIAM could truly call its own, and in December of 1874, the Academy bought its first piece of property at 12 West 31st Street, a four-story brownstone house in which they began to meet in May of 1875. Barely a decade later, though, they had outgrown the space and were looking for a new and more spacious home. They finally settled on a lot at, on West 43rd Street, between 5th and 6th Avenues. R.H. Robertson was selected as the architect, and construction began on October 2, 1889. Exactly a year later, the Academy met for the first time in its new building. Here's a view of Warshuffer Hall, the reading room. Expensive upgrades to all of the systems and a lack of space for the library contributed to growing and vocal dissatisfaction. And by 1911, the Academy was again thinking about moving. 1923 brought an outpouring of generosity that paved the way for the building we have today. That January, the Carnegie Corporation gave a million dollars to the Academy for a new building, and the Rockefeller Foundation pledged one and a quarter million dollars for an endowment. Both foundations made it clear that raising the money to buy the land on which a new building would sit was the Academy's responsibility. So a committee of 60 was appointed and went to work. They even commissioned the famous comic strip artist Claire A. Briggs to make them a poster. By the end of May, they had raised over $500,000. Before the campaign ended, Nyan purchased a lot on the southeast corner of Park Avenue and 60th Street, but they realized almost immediately that it was too small. In 1924, our present site at 103rd and 5th Avenue was found. The treasurer was authorized to buy it, and on April 14th, Lindsley Williams, the Academy's director, announced it had been purchased, at which time the trustees decided that they did not want it. Unknown to them, Dr. Williams was so convinced that this was the right place for the Academy that he had already bought the corner using his own funds so that it would not be lost. The architectural firm York & Sawyer had already drawn up plans for the now-abandoned Park Avenue site. Now they designed a building for the Fifth Avenue lot, seen here in a beautiful pencil sketch by consulting architect Henry D. Whitfield, as well as in a second pen and ink drawing. Our 1926 building is almost austere in its appearance, partly because the lot immediately to the south, where the apartment building at 1215 Fifth Avenue now stands, is still empty, as is the lot directly across the street to the north, where the Museum of the City of New York built its home a few years later. The rest of the block, to the east of the Academy, running all the way to Madison Avenue, was full of little brownstones, only two of which remain today. The elaborate entrance, in contrast to the facade, which is quite plain, conveys the idea that the Academy is really a temple to the heritage of Western medicine. Directly above the door is a lunette, depicting Asclepius, the Greek god of medicine, and his daughter Hygieia, the goddess of health. Asclepius holds his staff, with the single snake twined around it, and they are flanked by their dogs, who are the defenders against death. Then, running all along the top of the door itself, are small bronze figures of the two of them, sitting back to back. Decorative animals like this lion flank the door on either side, and smaller carvings like this one flank the windows. Further up, on either side of the third floor arched window right above the entrance, two physicians gaze at each other across the staff of Asclepius. Let's go back to this image for just a moment. 
Some space was left above the first floor windows for Latin inscriptions, but they were not selected until construction was well underway. When they were added at the end, most of them had to be truncated, not always in ways that made sense, to fit into the available space. The interior design of the building was managed by Barnett Phillips, an architectural decorator who worked on many York and Sawyer projects. Phillips bought several tapestries for the building, as we can see in this view of the lobby. The ceiling above is meant to look like a paneled wooden ceiling, but it is really made of painted plaster with elaborate decorative motifs. Here's another view of the lobby from the back, standing near the elevators. And the designs for some of the ceiling motifs showing animals, plants, and the bowl of Hygieia with its sipping snake. The lobby floor is travertine marble, inlaid with a variety of ornaments similar to those in the ceiling. Here we have an acanthus leaf, a dog with a snake in its mouth, a rabbit, a squirrel, and again, the bowl of Hygieia. A lovely auditorium, Hasek Hall, named for Dr. Alexander Hasek, a son of the more famous Dr. David Hasek, who cared for the families of Alexander Hamilton and Aaron Burr, sits to the east of the lobby and looks today very much as it did in 1927 when this photograph was taken. This is the view from the stage, looking out over the audience and the balcony, and a recent photograph taken from the balcony itself. Up on the third floor is Wurrishuffer Hall, the main library reading room, with its beautiful double height windows and chandeliers designed by the Caldwell Company, a famous New York lighting designer. The reader tables, which are 12 feet long, were commissioned especially for the space. The ceiling, like the one in the lobby, is plaster, elaborately painted to look as if it is made from wood and covered with animal and floral designs. The inspiration for many of those decorations comes from the tapestry that still hangs in this room, which depicts all kinds of birds and animals in a woodland setting. We can see that the library tables did not stay empty for long, as space to store the runs of many current journals ran out. More than a decade ago, as the way patrons use libraries changed dramatically, the Academy decided to repurpose this space as an event space and it's a popular venue for celebrations and professional meetings. By 1932, the library was almost out of space, and an addition was added to the building, rising four floors above the auditorium. Construction was documented by a set of photographs taken one seat's week, beginning on October 7th. Here are a few of them, showing just how quickly the project proceeded. All of the exterior work was done by the end of the year. A space for the rare and special collections was one of the main reasons for the addition. Thanks are due again to a wonderful benefactor, Edward S. Harkness, who contributed $400,000 towards the cost of construction. This pencil sketch shows that the original plan for the rare book room was an incredibly grand one. The room we ended up with is slightly more modest, but still wonderfully elegant and ornate. This photograph shows the original setup with tables in the alcoves to take advantage of the natural light. The patterned floors are cork because it absorbs sound, and beautifully carved borders surround the wooden shelving. The ceiling is plaster, embossed with English roses, vines, and real and mythological animals, like this winged dragon, and these fish, and even a rooster. The light fixtures, designed like the others in the building by the Caldwell Company, are uniquely embellished with early printer's marks, and here are the original designs. A generous gift from the Lefrak family in 2012 allowed us to upgrade the climate control systems in the room and restore the windows and floors, but it continues to look much the same as it did back in 1933. The original furniture is still there, and we welcome readers from around the world when they want to use the collections. Thank you so much for spending a little time with me today to learn about our building and I look forward to welcoming you in person sometime in the future. Remember, you can always find us at niam.org backslash library if you want to learn more or do research. <laughs>